Good evening, board members. Welcome to our board of directors meeting for the LPRCA this uh, Wednesday, the fifth day of May. And I hope uh, despite the COVID that we're going through right now, I hope your spring season is going well for you. <clears throat> board members, staff, guests, and members of the public are advised that this meeting is being video, audio recorded and live streamed through the LPRCA YouTube channel. As such, comments and opinions expressed may be published and any comments expressed by individual board members, guests, and the general public are their own and do not represent the opinions or comments of the authority and or the LPRCA board of directors. The recorded video of the full authority meeting is not considered the official recording of the meeting. The official record of the full authority meeting shall consist solely of the minutes approved by the full authority. That's a comment that I have to read before every meeting while we're virtual streaming during these COVID times. Are there any additional agenda items to be discussed this evening? I don't see any hands up, so we'll move on. Madam Clerk, oh, she's not here. Do we have to wait for the clerk to be in attendance? She's here. Oh, there she is. Okay, she just slipped away for a minute. Is there any declaration of conflict of interest? None noted, Madam Clerk. We have uh, two delegations. They will, each delegation will have 10 minutes to speak. Our first delegation is from Carlotta James, and she is going to give us a report with respect to the Monarch Ultra Relay Run. Okay, I'll let her into the meeting room. Zach is going to let her into the meeting room. Hello. <clears throat> Hi, Carlotta. Uh, this is Mike Columbus, the chair, and we are here as the board of directors for the Long Point Region Conservation Authority. We appreciate you uh, coming to share your knowledge with us with respect to the Monarch Ultra Relay Run, and you may proceed. You do have 10 minutes for this presentation. Excellent. Thank you very much to the LPRCA. I'm just going to use a short form because it's a very long conservation authority name. Uh, my name is Carlota James and I'm the co-founder of the Monarch Ultra, a relay run documentary and conservation project. And I'm so thrilled to be with you uh, tonight. I'm going to do a screen share if that's possible. Um, let's see. Oh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Um, is there some way that I could uh, share my screen because I prepared a presentation for tonight? Okay, I'm going to, we do have our IT uh, person with us at the meeting here and I see he's uh, looking into that. Okay. Um, in the meantime, uh, I can talk about it without, I don't need a PowerPoint presentation. Are you ready for that? Okay, he's, he's ready to go. Oh, okay. Let's see. Okay. Here it is. Um, there we go. And I'm just there we go. We got it. Thanks. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so the Monarch Ultra uh, is one of the most thrilling projects that I've ever been involved with. Uh, this group of people that you see in front of you um, are, this is when we got to Mexico uh, in 2019. Um, and so I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, we decided to run the migratory route of the monarch butterfly first to understand what that route looked like and second to galvanize all the communities along the migratory route um you know to see what they were doing to protect monarchs and other pollinators to engage with communities and youth and students and so the whole journey took us seven weeks from peterborough ontario to macheros mexico in total we ran 4,300 kilometers it was a very epic <laughs> journey. Um, it took a few years to plan. Um, and this picture that you see in front of you, uh, this is when we crossed the border into Mexico and uh, there's government uh, personnel bes beside us. They work for the Ministry of the Environment. And then there was students from the university that came to uh, greet us. And I'm there in the Monarch Butterfly Wing 
wings. Um, I had just crossed the border and, you know, we were thrilled that uh, uh, so many Mexican uh, agencies and people were there to greet us. Um, and so I'll go to the next page now. So we decided to do this because monarch butterflies, like all pollinators, are in decline and their numbers have plummeted to an alarming rate. Um, I've been a runner my whole life. Uh, you know, I've been running along trails and I'm always inspired by my natural surroundings and everything that I see around me. And at the same time, I've noticed, you know, that there haven't been that many monarchs around. And so I started to think about their migratory route and what it would feel like to run it. Um, and that's where, when I came up with this idea of running the migratory route. And so it all happened in 2019 and um, we were thrilled with, uh, you know, the reception that we received um, all along the way. Um, and so this is our mission, unite communities along a migratory path with common goals of earth stewardship and biodiversity conservation. The monarch butterfly itself connects the three, our three countries, Canada, the United States and Mexico. Um, it is one of the, uh, it's, it, this insect is, you know, has one of the longest known insect migrations on earth. Um, and it's been happening for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but at the same time, you know, if we don't do something now to protect monarch butterflies, they could completely disappear. It is an endangered species. Um, and so we're trying to raise as much awareness as possible. This was our route. You can see Peterborough right at the top and we ran uh, through southern Ontario and through the states for about four weeks and then we ran for two weeks uh, in Mexico until we got to Macheros, Mexico. Macheros is where there is um, a monarch butterfly sanctuary called the Cerro Pelon monarch butterfly sanctuary and we have a very strong partnership uh, in that community and so that's why we decided to end it uh, there. Um, on September 19th, uh, two years ago, we had our launch event here in Peterborough and most of our community came out to support us and cheer us on and uh, these are just some pictures from that first uh, that first day. Um, and I'm just going to show you a few photos. This was when uh, we crossed into Mexico. Um, that was me running that day. I ran 50 kilometers. Um, uh, lots of school kids came out and they had, you know, monarch butterfly signs that they had made. The reason I should mention why we decided to organize an ultra marathon was because one butterfly flies over 4,000 kilometers in their fall migration. So we really wanted to make this ultra marathon difficult and we didn't want to make it short. We didn't want to make it, you know, easy for runners. We really wanted to try to understand uh, what monarch butterflies go through. So that's why we decided to make it an ultra marathon as opposed to 10, a 10 kilometer run, you know, for each section. Um, we also gave school presentations. Um, this one was at the American School Foundation in uh, Monterrey. Um, and since then that school has built pollinator gardens because of our presentation and our awareness building. So that's really great news. Um, we also gave council presentations um, as much as we could, you know, our days were really, really busy. Um, and so that day I got to give a presentation to the city of San Antonio. Um, it's the fourth largest city in the state. So it was quite an honor to be there and to talk about, uh, you know, the connections between climate change and uh, monarch butterfly decline. Um, and then this is the last city of our relay run, Macheros, Mexico. It was quite an honor to arrive and have the whole community out. They had flags, as you can see, it was a pretty special event. Um, so we were so, um, you know, our lives changed because of this event and we decided to host the Monarch Ultra Relay Run every two years. Um, and then COVID hit and so we had to change all of our plans and so we will not be running from Peterborough to Mexico this fall. Instead, we'll be running in Southern Ontario. Um, the Relay Run will take place along the Trans-Canada and Waterfront Trails. Um, it'll be about three weeks that we're running from Peterborough to Barrie. Um, we're going to cover, you know, quite uh, a long distance again, 1800 kilometers. We're raising awareness again about pollinators and bio biodiversity conservation. Um, and we're also fundraising for Camp Corth. At each event that we organize, we um, host fundraisers, uh, you know, for monarch conservation, but in this case, it's for Camp Corth. This is the route right here. And day one, you can see is Peterborough, and we're going to be going all the way to Toronto, Hamilton, and winding down to Lake Erie. 
before eventually uh, going back up to Barry. Um, and so, you know, the reason for this presentation to uh, your conservation authority is to raise awareness about what we're doing, but also with hopes that we can partner with you and all the conservation organizations that we're running through so that they know that we're doing this, but also, you know, so that you can uh, hopefully uh, galvanize your own uh, communities and your own networks uh, to support what we're doing. We're a team of volunteers. So we do this when we have spare spare time from our full-time jobs and families. Um, uh, but it, you know, we, we do this from a, a, a place of uh, passion and love for the earth. Um, another event that we're organizing this year is the Monarch Ultra Virtual. So for those of you that aren't ultra runners and can't run 50 kilometers, um, we decided to organize something shorter. So if you are interested, you can visit that website at the bottom. It's race roster and look for Monarch Ultra Virtual 10K. Um, and the same thing, we're raising awareness for monarch butterflies and raising funds for Camp Kawartha. You can participate anytime between April to November. Um, and with this option, you can run, walk, bike, or hike 10 kilometers from anywhere in North America. So I encourage all of you to sign up and get moving. Um, that's my little spiel. I'm going to show you a video now that we created. Um, on our event because it's really <coughs> exciting. Um, and if you want to contact me, there's my contact information or if you want to follow along on the Monarch Ultra's social media sites, we have them available as well. Um, okay, I feel right very here. rushed. Uh, do I still have three minutes or is that it for the 10 minutes? minutes. Madam Clerk? Three minutes. Yes, we'll give you three minutes. Okay, are you ready for a video now? <laughs> it's we always are. nicer to see a video about what someone is talking about. Um, we have a filmmaker that is uh, making a documentary about this whole thing. So he's put together a three minute sizzle. So that's what I'm gonna show you right now. And let's see where that is. Is it here? Maybe here, let me just see. Mm, no, I'm sorry, let me just see where it is. <laughs> Screen share. Oh, here. Okay. Um, there we go. In 2019, we did the impossible. We ran from Canada to Mexico. 46 runners for all over North America ran the migration route of the modern butterfly, a continuous relay run of 4,300 kilometers in 47 days. The runners faced extreme weather conditions, battle injuries, ran through highways and desolated landscapes. All that with the mission of raising awareness towards pollinator conservation. Really cool project. So glad y'all are making this happen. This is amazing. So privileged to be doing this with the Monarch Ultra. Um, we really think the Monarch Ultra is a way to connect us, but also to do something positive. Ellos vinieron desde Canadá para sensibilizarnos sobre la importancia que tiene la ruta migratoria de la mariposa monarca. Their populations are in steep decline. You know, there's many reasons for that. It's pesticide use, climate change, habitat loss, disease. And it's not just monarch butterflies, it's all pollinators that are in decline. And without them, our food security systems would be hurt, as well as all of our ecosystems. They pollinate 80% of the flowering species on this earth. <laughs> so without pollinators, in 50 years, we would have nothing. We ran for the Monarchs then, and we're doing it again this year. The 2021 Monarch Ultra takes place in Canada, beginning in Peterborough and ending 1,800 kilometers and 21 days later in Barrie, Ontario. We want to see massive community involvement, like the ones we experienced in Mexico, when hundreds of people came out to cheer the runners and join the movement of taking action towards environmental conservation. This year, we will be raising money for Ken Kawartha Environment Center in Peterborough. We want to support their fantastic efforts in environmental education. It's a run like no other Canada has ever seen. 
along the scenic Trans Canada and waterfront trails through cities and towns, parks, and lake shores. Come and join us, either as a runner, a cheerleader, or as an environmental advocate. We need your legs, your voice, and your presence to tell the whole country that we care about our natural environment. Okay, so that's it. This is uh okay. Carlotta, are you ready for some questions? I hit me with it with everything you got. Does anyone have a question <laughs> with respect to Carlotta's uh presentation? Yes, we'll start with Dave Barris. Thank you. Good to see you again, Carlotta. Thanks for coming to our virtual meeting. Much appreciated. Uh just please tell the group uh what date you'll be going through Tilsonburg and what you'll be covering at that particular time because we have a diverse group of people here from various counties and I think they'll want to know roughly what what time of day they'll be, you'll be going through their county. I'm, I'm just looking on our map right now because we're going through quite a number uh, of cities so October um, 5th I'll tighten it up for you that's what you it's October 5th. Dave, you know, you can give this presentation by the time I'm done this, you'll be my right hand person. It'll be fabulous. October 5th, we're coming through Tilsonburg. That we, we also, I should mention, we end in Tilsonburg and then we begin in Tilsonburg. So we're gonna have two days in Tilsonburg. Oh. No. <laughs> Is that okay. incorrect? Moving on to Valerie. Hi, Carlotta. This is really great. I love the shirt. And uh, you have to end in Port Burwell because we have Monarchs Landing. Mr. Ron Allenson has a nature conservancy here on the north shore of Lake Erie. I don't know if you've heard of him. He has a, a hot spot for birding, but he's named his uh, piece of estate on the is Monarch's Landing. And I will make sure that he contacts you. Please okay? do. I, I have not heard of uh, of Monarch Landing in Port Burwell. I mean, that would be so fantastic to visit his sanctuary oh, yeah. uh, and connect also different people to what he's doing. Um, and Dave Burris, yes, Barris, I know it's October 5th. <laughs> that we're coming through Tilsonburg. Okay, I saw another hand up there. I think Tom Michelli. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Carlota. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I think that these are the types of things that are very appropriate to, uh, to inform the uh, members of the Long Point Region Conservation Authority. Um, I, I do uh, wonder if you're able to comment on uh, what you see as the uh, perhaps the role of conservation authorities with regard to the uh, the preservation of these uh, pollinators that are all apparently uh, uh, at such great risk. So uh, maybe you can comment on perhaps what role we might be able to play to assist in this endeavor. Um, I'm going to be quite candid. I I hope and I wish that conservation conservation authorities uh, would make it their priority policy wise um, to, you know, contact not only the provincial government, but the federal government, um, the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change about this. I mean, they don't talk about this enough. And year after year, we see habitat loss, we see degradation, we see environmental destruction, we see pollinator decline, we see disease and we see pesticide use. So. Um, it's, I know it's hard to talk about to, to some of those uh, uh, ministries at the provincial and, and federal level, but, you know, <laughs> if we can knock at their doors, if we can call them, if we can make sure that this is front and center, the thing is, we all need to eat. So this, this isn't just about pollinators in decline, it's also about human beings. Without pollinators, we really do not eat. I mean, they provide such an important ecosystem service. And personally, I don't see enough being done um, at the federal or the provincial level. So um, I guess that's my question to this conservation authority. What can we do uh, to get in contact uh, with 
you know, with those politicians. Um, I, I just think we need to do more where we're not at a point that we're at an urgent time right now. And, uh, you know, if, if more isn't done, then we're going to be at a point where we're hand pollinating like they're doing in Japan right now. You know, they have teams of people that go around and hand pollinate cherry trees and other fruit trees and uh, vegetable crops. So um, the situation is dire. Um, and, you know, my presentation is optimistic and I come from a place of hope and love, but I also go to bed really scared. And this is something that worries me. And I have a child that I care about. So, you know, many of us have kids that what is think about like, what is, what is this earth going to look like 20 years from now, 40 years from now? So maybe that wasn't the answer you were expecting, but um, I think we all have to raise our voices um, and be a little bit uh, more demanding uh, to the federal government. Carlota, thank you very much. That was, that was precisely the answer I was hoping for. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I thought I saw another hand up. For a question no okay well i just wanted to say uh thank you carlotta for your gift of time and energy and promoting the monarch butterfly habitat here at the lprca we have approximately eleven thousand acres of land under authority ownership i'm sure some of that is in milkweed uh habitat which is absolutely necessary for uh survival of the monarch and uh, my grandson six years old, he goes around collecting cocoons and he hatches out several dozen every year. So it's a pretty interesting school project for a young, uh, young youth there. And uh, there's no more questions. So I thank you for your presentation and I will need a mover and a seconder for this motion that the LPRCA Board of Directors receives the Monarch Ultra Relay Run presentation by Carlotta James as information. The mover. Moved by Dave. Moved by John. Seconded by. I need a seconder. Oh, Dave Barris. Okay. All in favor? <coughs> I see all the hands up. That is carried. Thank you very much. Have a good summer, Carlotta. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And thank you very much, Dave Barris. And we'll see you on October 5th. And thank you all for listening to uh, my presentation. Have a good day. I think Dave, Dave's getting ready to do that big run. From, uh, uh, I might walk, but uh, I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. Thank you. Me too, you. I okay. hope we can hug by then. That we won't I'm sure have to we stand. Will. Good. Six feet apart. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next delegation. This is a deputation by Garrett Reed and Garth Potroff, and it's with respect to uh, a Big Creek venture that they wish to share some concerns with us. So are you going to let us in here? I'm just waiting for their, our IT professional here to uh, have them come on stream here. Oh, hello. Hello. OK. Are you there, Garrett? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, you're both in the room. We are here at the LPRCA board meeting on the fifth day of May here. And okay. you did have some concerns you had with respect to a budget decision that this board made some time ago. And you do have 10 minutes to uh, make your presentation between the two of you is 10 minutes. Okay, so you can proceed now. Okay, um, I'm going to be doing the presentation, Michael. Um, I'm going to go to share screen. So I'll just, this is the first time I've done this. So let's see how she goes. So can everybody see that okay? Yes, we see it. Okay. Um, my name is Gareth Potroff. Um, I'm the owner of the Grand River Rafting Company. And um, I'm working with Garrett Reed to help him start up a new tourism attraction in uh, Norfolk County. And so it, the idea is to do uh, tubing on Big Creek. And so if you don't know what tubing is, that's what it looks like. And how it works is people park, we shuttle them upstream to the launch at Rowan Mills, and then they paddle back and then they're shuttled back to their car. We actually call it the, um, what we call it, the couch potato market of Southern Ontario, 
because we know we'll see everybody alive when they're done the trip at the end. Um, in April of this year, the uh, Long Point Conservation Authority approached us and told us that there was going to be a fee structure change. And uh, it was going to be going from last year we paid $50 uh, as a user fee, and this year it was going to be $350 plus an additional $4 per person. Um, that was quite a shock because what that works out to is going from $50 to $7,000 just to use the uh, Rowan Mill launch. So I want to kind of share with you what happened last year. Um, I'm going to just move ahead to the next film here. So Garrett's business is a startup business. And in 2020, he actually attracted 1,700 paddlers to come and try Big Creek. Roughly, and if you look down, you'll see where they came from. 500 came from within 30 minutes, but 1,200 came from more than an hour away. And with spending, I'm talking into the community, that 1,200 people would have probably generated around $40,000 in sales. This year, we're hoping to operate instead of eight weeks, 12 weeks. Um, we're hoping to attract, now that we've got it established, between 3,000 to 3,500 visitors. Um, we know that that's going to bring in roughly 75,000 to the local merchants. But one of the things we want to do is what I'm going to call a bias factor. And what we will be doing is when people come off the river, we're going to be handing them a coupon promoting merchants in the nearby vicinities. <coughs> the goal is, is to turn the paddling experience into a small town experience. Um, what I want to do right now is, is, is take six other outfitter entities and just show you a comparison of what they're charging for 2021 in prices. And, and what they have for infrastructure for their paddling launches. Um, three of them are gonna be county properties and three of them are gonna be conservation authorities. This is the first property, it's called Glen Morris. It's in the county of Brant. You can see it's about an acre in size. And what they do is they cut the grass here, they maintain the garbage. There's two porta potties. The launch is access friendly. There's a parking lot for about 30 cars. They have a turnaround in it. And they also supply benches and information chaos. They use a system of charging by the person. So um, it's $11.25 for five to 25 people. And if you have between 26 to 100, you can see it's around $22.50. So what that works out to is basically $2 if you have five people and roughly 25 cents if you bring in 100 people for the day. This is the Paris Dam, very slimmer. Uh, they cut the grass, they keep the garbage, they have washrooms interlocking stone lock, uh, capacity for 26 cars. Um, they also have a floating dock there. And you also have a boat trolley to pull the uh, boats up and down the hill. And they're using the same fee structure of that basically uh, what we call 25 cents to $2 a person. Another municipal launch is called Brent, uh, uh, Bean Park. Bean Park is a little different. Again, it has all the infrastructures in place, but they charge a seasonal fee. And that seasonal fee is, is only for drift boat or fly fishermen. And that is $35 per season for the year. And that's unlimited use. We're going to switch over now and look at some of the conservation authorities. Um, this is Brant Park. And this is their public outfitter. It's about an acre in size. Again, grass is cut, garbage. Um, they have porta potty supply. Um, with this launch, the outfitters have to share it with the general public. And the cost for that is $275 for the season. Now, um, Brant Park is gated, very similar to your Deer Creek, Bacchus Mills, uh, Waterford, where regardless of what you're doing in the park, you have to pay an entry fee. And that entry fee is at $6.64 you see at the bottom. The other thing is uh, Brant Park has is what's called a concession launch. The concession launch is only available to a private outfitter and they have the exclusive rights to do all the rentals within the park. And with that comes the ability for all the staff to stay at the uh, conservation area free of charge, supplying water and night security. And it's an exclusive launch. And that fee is $500 per season. And the gatehouse fee is 350. Again, regardless of what you're coming into the park to do, that is the set fee. 
Another one is Guelph Lake, and I actually call this the Madonna site. Uh, Guelph Lake has um, roofs over their picnic areas. They have change rooms. They have flush toilets. They have a beach. And that area circled in red is actually a 400 square foot boathouse that they supply. Uh, hydro, drinking water, and again, exclusive rights. And the fee for that per year is $550. And again, the same concept, a gate fee of 664, regardless of what you're doing. This is the Roland Mill site. Um, it's about a quarter acre in size. This is the one that we're using on Big Creek. Um, it may be mowed, it may not, we don't think it is. There is no garbage cans, there's no maintenance there. There are no washrooms there. There is uh, no maintained lots. There's no parking lot, no picnic tables, and there's no gatehouse. It has a gravel entrance. And this is what presently is being charged 350 a year, plus another $4 for every person that uses it. Um, this is, if you've never been to the launch, this is what the Roland Mills launch looks like. Um, basically, it's a plain Jane. There's, there's really nothing there. Um, this is at, uh, standing at the launch, looking up the road to drive in. So that gives you a feel for it. And this is the launch. It's a, a wooden dock uh, put into a clay soil, and that's it. This chart is just a comparison showing you the county properties and the GRCA uh, properties. And what you'll notice is that all of those properties have grass mowed, they have maintained boat launches, they have parking lots, they have garbage cans and garbage collection, they have porta potties, and they have picnic tables, and they also have kiosks. They all have that, but Rowan Mills really has none of those. And the other thing that the conservation authorities offer is what we call optional infrastructures like free camping for staff, um, night security, and so it, it it's a, of a different ballpark as well. So the conservation authorities actually charge a seasonal fee while the county charges a per person fee. And as you can see, um, what Rowan Mills is charging is way above what anybody else in the area is charging. One of the things I do, do wanna talk about, um, I'm now gonna, I'm, I'm actually one of the directors for all the attractions in Ontario. And it's very similar to yourselves, we are dependent on funding from uh, to, to stay alive. It's not really a, a profitable uh, organization. So we're always looking for alternatives. And one of the things I would like to encourage Long Point to look at is the idea of partnering with local attractions. And I'm going to give an example of that partnering. As you know, the, the GRCA is huge. I think their intake is over 30 million a year. And we're like a fly on the wall. They don't need us. But what they actually do is they do a symbiotic relationship with us. And we actually sit down with them and talk about how we can enhance each other. As a result of that enhancement, last year at the Brant Park, we brought in $65,000 in gate intakes at the gatehouse. You can imagine if you did that kind of partnership, $65,000 coming into Bacchus Mills or $65,000 coming into Deer Creek. But another thing goes with that, when we partnered with them, how can I say it? Their pains and their gains are ours. And our company has really become vested in what they're doing. And now in the last couple of years, we've been donating $20,000 every year to Brant Park to help them improve their infrastructures and, and, and make it a better place. Um, what I would like to propose here is what would be a fair, like we want to invest in it, a fair fee would be probably more likely a dollar a person. And what we would like to see to go with that is, we'd definitely like to see an outhouse come into the uh, Rolling Mill site. Right now, the outhouse is the biggest tree people can find. And with no garbage cans or anything, we actually do all the picking up of the garbage there. And so uh, for garbage patrol, Bacchus Mills is only six minutes away, just taking some of the staff and coming over, cleaning up the garbage and taking away each day. It's a very simple investment. A washing would cost about $750 for three months. Um, so what we're proposing is if we did a dollar a person, we'd like to do a minimum payment of $1,500 to ensure that the Long Point Conservation Authority outhouse fee is covered and they're still doing okay. If the Long Point Conservation Authority doesn't want to invest in the infrastructure, then a, a fee of around $350 is more than fair. So gentlemen, that is my, and ladies, that is my presentation. 
and we just like to see a more reasonable fee that's in line with what's out there and also considers the infrastructure uh, that Rowan Mills has versus what everybody else has. I'm open to questions. You're unmuted now. Okay. Uh, thank you, Garth, for that presentation. Uh, questions of the uh, board. By the way, can I get? Uh, did you did you actually see the presentation on on your monitor? Were you able to see it? Okay, good. Thanks. Questions to the uh, presenter? Don't see any. Yes, Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't necessarily have a question. I just wanted to comment on uh, that was an excellent presentation that uh, provided a lot of information. Um, I think we have some work to do here. Thank you. Robert, did I see your hand going up? Uh, thanks, uh, Mike, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through you to uh, Garth. Uh, Garth, you indicated in your presentation that you sat down with the uh, uh, GRCA and, and try to work out something that was uh, in the best interests of uh, both the Conservation Authority and uh, uh, yourself and your business. Uh, can you just elaborate a, a little bit on that and maybe uh, suggest if you'd be prepared to do that with uh, Long Point? Yeah, um, I'll tell you a little bit about our business. Um, we generated, we brought in over 45,000 people last year. Um, and so, for Brant Park, that was amazing exposure because 90% of those people had never been to this area. And so by what we are, is, um, the attraction is exactly it. It's a drawing card to bring people in. And then that allows the parks to showcase what they have. And, and when you put those two together, you've got an amazing combination, especially down at Long Point. Like you guys have Mike MacArthur and Dave Pond. They are, they've got the street sparks to really help the conservation authorities be far more productive and they are of the same mindset of us how do we contribute to the community and make a difference and and that was the talk with the grca was how do we use our resources and enhance their resources it's site Sorry, that's breaking up. On the group. I think we've lost your audio, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair. Can we send him a message maybe on one of these messaging boards? We lose Judy too? Uh, no, I'm here, Crystal. I just shut everything down to see if it make it better. <laughs> I put they. Are, are you in the building with them? Do you hear yeah, I'm in my office. Do they realize it? Yeah. Uh, wave your hands if you can hear us. Oh, now time. you're good. Nope. Don't see it. Okay. All right. So this computer's gone here. I'm going to have to reconfigure this. Uh, they're able to hear us now. Give me just a second while we get everything back together. Sorry everyone for the difficulty here.
Are you back, Mike? Can I ask a couple <clears throat> questions while we wait, or do we want to? <clears throat> Hey, are we ready? Just Crystal's asking if she's able to ask some questions while we wait. Okay. Uh, who was that that wanted to ask some questions? Crystal? Go ahead, Crystal. I guess she can't hear us. Sorry, uh, Garrett, I think I missed the first part. What What was the issue was over the $4 per person? Was that the crux of the? Well, the, the issue was that Originally, we were paying uh, $50 for the whole show. Um, $4 a person, if you look at all the infrastructures that everybody else is offering. In I'm just, Canada, but what, it's the, it's the rate per yeah, person, it's not the, rate, the 350 it's, Yeah, so either one or the other, but even the $4 is too high for the service that's being supplied at that, uh, that site. There's, there's nothing in place at all. So when you look at services, um, did you ever have any calls for, for fire or ambulance? Like to me, four bucks a person for an experienced tubing, you know, I'm, I'm, I get, you know, I get the concerns, but you, you pay money to do all these activities uh, in today's day and age. So to me, it's, you know, to put a washroom up, to be able to run your business, um, you know, I, I, to me, I would think that's that's the responsibility of the business owner to go and, and do that, just like anybody else that has a business out in the community. Um, but also, you know, we do have a, as soon as fire or ambulances are dispatched out there, there is a cost to uh, our community and our taxpayers to be able to, to do that. Well, that same fee also applies in Grant County. Um, so that's actually included in all of those infrastructures is fire. OPP support 911. Actually, I set up a 911 rescue system for the Grand River. Yeah, but I, I saw I did see some higher fees associated with um, the uh, the table that that you showed us there. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, when you show the one, was it Guelph Lake? Um, yeah. You know, the 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 nature of Big Creek. Uh, in fact, I, I I received a big sort of long list of of concerns that people had with the operation there. You guys have a trailer park there, is that correct? Yes, we have permission. So we contacted them before we got permission to put the trailer in. That trailer came in every morning at seven to eight and was gone at two o'clock. And then it would not come back in again early till the next morning. So it was um, kept, yeah. yeah, so I, I think some of the concerns from that I, I read from people sending in was that they weren't able to navigate and turn around. It's a relatively small area. It's maybe not set up for a business in quite the same way as an open area like Guelph Lake from the pictures, the aerial views that you've showed. So I think everywhere is kind of unique. And, and to me, you know, tubing down Big Creek is something that if I was to go and do it, I would, you know, that's a, that's a that's a service charge that you can put to your customers over and above just like when you go somewhere else uh the fee that they're paying so if it's 20 bucks to go tubing or 50 bucks to go tubing you know that's four dollars that they're you know they're contributing to uh you know to our tax base which takes to run some of those emergency services and so on in today's day and age i don't i don't know that i buy that that's so extreme um it, it really is because um Everybody else, uh, that's why I use the other comparisons, are charging a dollar. Um, that is much more. And I think the other thing is we could look at a long term, but to suddenly uh, come to us before the season starts and say, surprise, you've got this rate increase. It, it really took us off guard. We, we are stuck now with the situation that we've got out there with the bookings. But for what other Southern Ontario launches are doing with the same services that Norfolk would be supplying, it is around a dollar a person, or it's a set fee of, of $350 to $500. That gate fee is charged regardless of what they're going in. And that's only charged at parks like um, very similar to Waterford and Deer Creek. Mr. Chair, I just, I'll just make one final comment. I, I mean, for me, I don't know. I, I find that a little bit challenging. We've, you know, for Norfolk, we've just, uh, you know, massively raised taxes over the last couple of years and, and slash services. And to me, you know, this does come with a cost. It's very similar. We've had, you know, with the Waveline operations last year, we had countless uh, EMS and fire calls. And I, you know, I, 
I fully support small business and you guys trying to make a go of it there and so on. I think your coupon idea is fantastic. Um, but to me, four bucks, again, that's that's a service that that's a charge that you can say to your customers. Well, Norfolk County and, and Long Point, they're, they're making you pay this this extra service charge. Um, and that's a pretty nominal fee to really come down to a pretty unique uh, environmental area that is quite unlike some of the other um, areas that uh, that you had posted. Um, the only problem is um, what you probably don't realize is that people can get that same experience on the Grand River. And it's, it's a two hour longer drive there and back coming down to Norfolk. And with that, the actual tourism population drops by 15% compared to where we are up here. And so if people are gonna drive further um, to pay higher prices, drive two hours more, and also have an infrastructure that's totally absent, it's not worth coming that far to do it. So. That's another factor you need to consider. You need to upgrade your infrastructures so that you actually are attracting people to come. Mm -hmm. Right yes, now, yes. It's, it's not there. But I also, just can I touch on something here? Um, like com comparing us to Waveline, it's a, I worked right next Hi, to Richard Hi, and he's like completely re uh, uh, reckless. And I don't think you should be putting sorry, people on, sorry, you know, sorry. rockets without a boat boating we license. Anyways, anyways, but I don't believe uh, we, we had next to no issues. And we do a very thorough talk with people before we send them down the river, including what not to do, what to do. We check for alcohol. And we also, um, we also, generally attract older people and families. And I know Garth, you could probably touch on you, how many incidents you guys have had, because I don't think you've had any major problems through all yeah. the 16 years you've been operating. Yeah, so we've been in operation 16 years. We have capacity to do 2000 people a day. We have 55 people on staff and we've never had an incident. That's the liability and the stance that we take in looking after our customers. We've never been uh, an occurrence for the County of Brant. Oh my good God. I think we lost him again. Yeah, I think we did. Hello? All right, is our audio coming through? It's coming through now. I tried to configure this, uh, this microphone and uh, sound issue. Sorry, everyone. Can you hear us now? We can hear you, Mike. We can't see you. Great. Okay. So we'll have to go without the camera for now. We will have to go without the camera for now on uh, John and I. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties we're having here at headquarters. Uh, Mr. Chair, are you able to see the rest of the participants? Yes, I do believe so. Okay. So I... Just, I'm raising my hand, I'm just testing that. Okay, I do see you, Tom. And I see uh, Stuart, Robert, Crystal, Valerie, Peter, Robert, Ian, Dave, and uh, Judy, and, and Garth, and Garrett, I guess. Ben Hody, too. Okay, John has a question here. Garth, uh, my question to you is, uh, this is obviously a business for you, right? Yes. Okay, so at three fifty a season for a yearly pass and four dollars a person, uh, with the number of participants that you have uh, 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 taking part in your in your uh, business, what kind of revenue are you generating? Well, I'm going to talk about Garrett's. So what we do with Garrett is um, we um, on his fees charging what thirty five dollars a person. We charge Garrett, um, so he ends up having an income of $21. And that's to pay his staff, passing, um, washrooms, maintenance, all that. And that's what he gets out of a cut. So basically it's a 60-40 cut. 
We supply all the vehicles, the trailers and the equipment. And the reason we do this is it's a startup business. And our goal is to help him get going, make a decision of whether it's viable to operate in Nor Norfolk or not. So that leads to another question then, is at $350 and $4, is that viable for you to operate in Norfolk? Garrett, it's, it's your show, what do you say? Um, I, I, I really don't know if it, it is because the volume that I push through and the amount of time and effort throughout the year that are that I've, I'm planning with Garth and Chad and, and really putting myself out there to try and make this work. Um, if I was getting charged four dollars a person, I would I probably would almost not be worth it with staff fees. Um, I, I'm paying to have a parking lot this year, so I don't have to congest the county parking lot down the road, and. Um, and just touching on like the congestion that's been happening at the launch, which hasn't really been us because we go down there once in the morning to drop our one trailer off, which takes up maybe one and a half parking spots. We maybe take up a little bit with our tubes, but there's a lot of people this year because of COVID that are going down there. And, uh, you know, one of the suggestions that I would have had going into this year with the LPRCA is maybe there's, an, maybe we can make either find a pathway so I don't have to go down there and be part of that congestion. I can just send people down. A, but yeah, no, I would say that $4 is definitely not really feasible for me um, if I want to make it and, and grow this business. Crystal? Okay. Um, well, I guess my suggestion is not, I mean, your, yourselves, like to me, a, a park fee, like anywhere I've traveled around the world, it's something over and above. I mean, that's something you can blame on Norfolk County. You know, it's a special fee that you've got to pay to, to be able to go down, you know, Big Creek. And, you know, I, I, again, with the washroom side of things, you know, you did show some that had a higher fee and uh, they also still charge that per person rate. I mean, it, the, the challenge for us with a washroom, I would say in COVID is I can't tell you how difficult that is even for us to manage in Port Dover and so on with cleaning and, and that kind of thing. Um, it's just, it's, it's an added challenge that we face. Um, but, but again, like if I were you, I mean, that's a fee that Long Point and Norfolk County have on there and, Big Creek is a very special place to be able to go. And, and it's, it's a pretty, again, it's a pretty nominal surcharge um, that, you know, you can take, a, you know, take off the, the, the presumption that it's from your business. That would just be kind of how I would approach that. Well, actually, it, it works out to about 20% of Garrett's uh, intake. So it, it's not nominal. Uh, my suggestion was over and above, Mr. Chair. Hey, I saw Tom's hand up. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I do have to uh, concur with the line of reasoning that, uh, that uh, board member Chop is uh, pursuing. Uh, I, I'm having a little bit of a hard time um, understanding that the suggestion I think from, I think from Garrett is that uh, that uh, the difference is three dollars. Uh, other places are charging a dollar per person, and uh, here we are proposing four dollars a person. I'm having a little bit of a hard time understanding that a three dollar additional fee. Uh, you know, so you're. I think you said that the fee per person would be thirty five dollars. I'm having a hard time understanding that the difference of three dollars, making it thirty eight dollars, would be prohibitive to people traveling the distances that you're suggesting. I, I just, I'm, I'm just having a hard time really uh, understanding that a $3 difference will uh, prohibit someone from taking part in this activity. It actually you, will Mr. impact them. What's interesting is uh, Long Point um, Eco Ventures is now because of this outfitter fee is totally pulling out of Big Creek uh, using the Rowan Mills. They're gonna go for private properties and operate off that instead, because it, it, it just doesn't fit in with the blend of what's fair compared to what all the other municipalities and conservation authorities are charging out there. And it's actually 
the same experience there. I paddled Big Creek a lot. I actually scouted it out 20 years ago and Grand River has that same caliber. So um, the Grand River, it, it, for me, it would be much easier to close the operation at Norfolk and have Garrett come and work for me. Um, that is much simpler than putting all this exercise and investment down at Norfolk. Okay, thank you, Darth. Okay, uh, any further questions? Yes, Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, would there be a more developed site that you could operate out of in that area rather than having to build up another one that, that obviously needs some work? What is the magic number that determines where people are going to turbo tube is um, it's about a nine to 10 kilometer distance. As you know, people today have become armchair vampires and that um, physical endurance is just gone. And so when you are looking at where to place things, you need that magic window of around the nine to 11 kilometer mark. Like we do a route that's 13 kilometers. To be honest with you, for most people, it's way too long. Okay, Peter, any further questions? I had one just before we went off air there with the technical difficulties, it was to guard. It was with respect to, uh, you mentioned a number of sites where you're partnering with different groups in the Grand River area. And uh, my question was with respect to uh, whether you do any tubing down the Grand River and what, you, what your services are there and what you charge uh, what, what are the what are your rates on the Grand River tubing if you do in fact do? Yep, it's, it's the exact same rate um, because we want to direct our customers down to Norfolk, so we didn't want to up the Norfolk because we knew that would be a discouragement. So we charge thirty five dollars. We are now um, we've actually like um, Long Point Eco Ventures have pulled off all county lands and totally operate on private lands. I actually own a half mile of the Grand River myself. And we partner with other companies. And again, we're, we're doing the same thing. Um, $1 to $2, but they're supplying the washrooms. They're mowing the lawns. They're maintaining the accesses, the launches. Like everything is looked after. The problem with Long Point is there's no infrastructure in place. Uh, there's no investment put for monies put in. Plus... $1 or $2, are you saying? Yeah, uh, some places it's $1. Um, we do a run from what's called Five Oaks United Church Camp down. That's $1. Um, uh, at the other private sites that we use, it's $2. And there is no $4 fee? No. Okay. Uh, back to Crystal, please. Go ahead. Um, one, so you never did say you charge 35 a person. And so how many people do you expect to open the season? Yeah, 20,000. Okay. So, you know, if, if that's the case, I mean, is one option that we could consider as a board or, or I don't know if this is better coming through Norfolk on that end with, if, with the, um, the per person fee, I mean, if, if you, you guys pay for, um, you know, the, the, um, the porta potty and maintaining the porta potty through the season. And if, you know, X number, you know, we set a target and if you have more than so many people come and obviously so many dollars to Norfolk County, uh, then we'll, we'll credit you back, you know, the money for the porta potty. Yep. Yeah. You know, that's, that's something that I could see doing. That'd be fair enough. I mean, if you're looking at 20,000 people, I, I find that's really the number going down there. Yeah, yeah, actually. So 20,000 yeah. people and, you know, that is, that's a chunk of revenue then that that's coming in. And I think that's fair enough then in that case that we would, if you achieve that target or if you achieve 15,000 target, then we'll go and, and we'll pay for, pay for the porta potty back. Yeah, the only problem is, you're with a startup business in the art of getting found. That's why I, on the projection, we're looking at maybe 3,000 at the best coming down this way. You would never be able to handle 20,000 people on Big Creek. I'm also a professional forester. Okay, that was, my, that was my, my question. Was yeah, just looking those. at the environment. Like with us, our maximum per launch is 500 people. If we go above 500 people per day, I think we have become destructive 
instead of conservative in maintaining the environment around us. So uh, Big Creek could not handle those numbers, definitely could not. It would, it would destroy the, what you've got there. Okay, we'll move on. Are there any further questions? If we're going to discuss any details with respect to a, a deal of some kind, the clerks advised me that we should be going in camera, but uh, we'll just leave it to the floor right now. Okay, so is there any other questions? Okay, the, the last question I have is to Garrett Reed, who uh, I don't know if he's there or not. I don't see him on the screen. Oh, there he is. Okay, Garrett. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Garrett, last year, I guess the the LPRC did not know that you were actually using uh, the Big Creek and those uh, destinations that were mentioned earlier as, as sites. And uh, you actually ended up having to sign a hold harmless liability clause, I believe. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we have a liability clause, I believe, for $5 million. And at that time, did the management of the LPRCA, did they not advise you that there would be a fee structure coming in the 2021 season? Um, I was, I, from what I recall, I was advised that the price would go up next year and I expected it to. Um, and in my defense, you know, when we started, we, with COVID hitting, we just kind of said, okay, let's give it a try. And uh, we went ahead and, now we're trying to do everything right before we get started this year. So other than the hold harmless clause that you signed, was there any fees paid to the LPRCA in 2020 season? Uh, other than the, I think it was 56 bucks or 50 bucks last year. No, they didn't ask for anything else. Um, we just tried to, uh, you know, keep our presence on the launch to as minimum as possible and, uh, we basically were the cleaners at the site because there were so many uh, just individual people going down on their own. And so, yeah, we, did, we didn't have any other fee last year from that. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. No further uh, questions. So I'm going to need a, a mover and a secondary for this one. That the delegation of Garrett Reed and Garth Pottriff regarding user fees be received as information. <coughs> And uh, then we'll, Tom Michelli, we'll Tom Michelli is the mover and the seconder is Valerie O'Donnell. And uh, all those in favor to receive this as information that is carried, Madam Clerk. And now, do you want to leave this to the end of the meeting to discuss further uh, under business or do you wish to deal with it at this time? I don't see any. I would say the end of the meeting. Okay. Uh, yes, Robert, you have a comment? Yeah, I, I was just going to suggest that uh, uh, it should be uh, referred to staff and, and uh, a report coming back uh, with various options, I, I think would be the way I would like to handle it, but uh, I'm at the discretion of the chairman and the board. But I'd be prepared to move, uh, move a motion that it be uh, uh, referred to staff and uh, uh, requesting a uh, a summary and a, and a report uh, for uh, further discussion at the board. But I'll leave it up to you. You are the mover of that motion then. And uh, is there a seconder? Stuart is the seconder. We'll go to discussion now, whether you want this to go to staff for a report. Yes, Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Garrett uh, once more. Garrett, when did you first become aware of the increase in fees for this season? Oh, uh, I can't remember the exact date because I don't have it in front of me. I think it's actually in the presentation, but it's it, April, it was, April 19th. April 19th would make sense, yeah. Okay, okay thank you. And uh, any further questions, last questions? Before I call the vote. Yes, Stuart, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Mike, I guess just a question for, for Garth or what are Garrett? What type of time frame do you need a response back uh, from this body as far as for your business ventures moving forward? What kind of time frame are we looking at? Garrett, I'll let you handle that because it's your backyard. Okay. Um, to be 
to be frank, I would say the sooner we can get an answer back, the better. Um, we already have a number of things in place. I've hired four people um, and I've already put together a contract with the parking lot that I'm renting. So the sooner the better. Uh, I mean, with COVID, there's some uncertainty, but we think everything's gonna open up. So uh, I, I would say within, before the, before the next couple of weeks would be nice so that we can plan. Thank you. And, and Mike, through the chair, just to follow up to that comment, the reason I asked the comment is we've heard the deputation. I'm not really prepared to negotiate at a Zoom meeting. I kind of agree with uh, Robert that uh, to staff can make this a priority to have a quick look at it and see what's possible and have a, have a chat with Norfolk Stores and the economic department and see if we can do anything. But I mean, to me, this process is, this is the first I've heard about this. So I think uh, it should be referred to some experts and not just kind of winged at, uh, you know, at 7.30 at, at, at a meeting. I know it's important, I know it's critical, but we do have a bit of time to do this correctly. I believe you are correct. This is a very difficult to negotiate things to, through uh, Zoom, that's for sure. So the motion is on the floor. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, how did that motion read, Madam Clerk? I think it just gave to the staff direction. Okay, to give uh, staff direction to present a report to the Board of Directors with respect to the, uh, the Garrett Reed Garth Potriff uh, presentation. Does that work? Okay. okay. I'll call the vote. Those in favor? Anybody opposed? That is carried. So to, to both of you, Garrett and Garth, uh, as, you, as you've just realized here, we are going to be getting a report on this and uh, see where it goes, okay? Thank you for so your time. appreciate it. Thank you for your time and thank you for expressing your concerns about this uh, latest proposal. Yeah, thank you for the time. Yes. So we'll now move to the minutes of the previous meeting. And this is pages one and two. This is the meeting of April the 7th. Hope you've all had a chance to look at that. Are there any uh, questions or discussion with respect to this report? Don't see any hands up. So need a mover and a seconder that the minutes of the LPRC Board of Directors meeting held April 7th, 2021 be adopted as circulated. Those in favor? Do you have a question, Ian? No? Mover? Ian's a mover, seconded by Peter. Those in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Next, do we have uh, the free park pass lending program. This is Aaron LaDuke is going to give us that uh, report. Aaron. Thank you. Um, the board asked staff to investigate the possibility of providing seasonal passes to libraries throughout the watershed to be loaned out um, for our five conservation parks. Um, staff did some research. Um, we found three um, other programs, uh, lending programs provided cons by conservation authorities. Uh, the first one um, was provided by Central Lake Ontario Conservation Authority. Um, it provides uh, 12 passes at the, for the city of Oshawa, 12 passes for the town of Whitby, and eight for the municipality of Clarington to be loaned out through their library services. Um, each pass can be checked out for three days, um, and there's a $1 late fee for each day and $75 for replacement of a lost card. Um, the second... Uh, a season pass loaning program provided through a library is provided by the Toronto Region Conservation Authority and Credit Valley Conservation Authority. Um, they provide 86 passes to the Mississauga Library System, 86 passes to the Brampton System, 26 passes, 27 passes to the Wellington County Public Library System, and 12 passes to the Orangeville System. Um, they have a seven day checkout period. Um, the third and final program that we um, found out that was provided through um, the library systems was provided by uh, the Grand River Conservation Authority. Um, this program is a two-year pilot program. 
Um, they provided 54 passes to be distributed to each library within the watershed. That's one per library. Um, the Grand River Conservation Authority also offered a group discount rate for libraries wishing to purchase additional passes. Um, GRCA also signed a memor memorandum of understanding with each individual library um, on, on the uses of the passes and the reporting to be provided to GRCA. Um, so this program that GRCA provides under the two-year pilot program um, is a fully funded pilot program. Um, there was a large donation by a manufacturer in um, the, water, uh, the Grand River watershed and the remaining funds were provided by the GRCA foundation. Um, a review of the three library systems um, providing free park pass lending programs. Um, the library catalogs indicate that just about every single pass is already checked out. And in some cases, there are already dozens of holds in place when they become available. Additionally, the three CAs providing these programs are in high density, highly populated watersheds with significantly larger budgets and uh, more staff capacity than LPRCA. Um, when it comes to Long Point's watershed, um, we have 15 libraries um, within our watershed. Of our participating municipalities, Brant County and the Township of Malahide do not have uh, library branches within the watershed. Um, additionally, uh, the libraries within our library systems operate on municipal boundaries, which creates risk of usage of the library system beyond the borders of our watershed. Um, another factor to consider, um, Deer Creek and Waterford North Conservation Authorities um, operate at or near capacity um, on weekends from mid-June through uh, Labor Day. So this um, provides the opportunity that there might be some canalization of our current revenue streams. Um, this also um, could impact behavior of some of our current um, season pass holders to utilize the library system instead of uh, purchasing a, a season pass from the authority. Um, finally, uh, the administration of the program and signing of MOUs uh, would place additional operational demands on the staff um, given the short turnaround time of the park opening shortly. Um, we, in looking at uh, providing this report, we looked at some alternatives that might be, um, uh, that might be um, uh, viewed in the, as an option for the board. Uh, one of those options we, we discussed was providing uh, two free passes to our member municipalities per thousand people within the watershed. Um, and then our member municipalities could use these as prizes or as draws uh, using their social media. Um, I think we came up with this idea um, Norfolk's currently giving out a gift card um, for filling out a survey on their social media. Um, and this would be less uh, cumbersome on staff in setting up MOUs and um, potentially cannibalizing some of our uh, revenues through providing library passes. Uh, the financial implications of uh, the alternatives, there's no additional outlays or costs associated um, with uh, the alternatives provided. However, um, foregone revenue for the authority and potential missing out on associated revenue for the alternatives is provided in the financial implications portion of the, the report. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions if there is any. Questions to Aaron. Yes, Delry. Can't hear you, Valerie. You're I volume. realize that. I'm filing that. Okay, Aaron. Um, are all of these uh, through you, you your, through your Mr. Chair to Aaron, sorry. Are these passes all for a whole week? It sounds like to me, because the ones that I've heard about were day during the week, not weekends. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, the passes provided through the different library systems. One was for three days um, mm -hmm. through uh, the uh, the one up in uh, Durham region for Oshawa. Um, there were three-day passes you could rent out for day use. And the other ones were through uh, GRCA in Toronto were seven-day passes. They were loaned out like a library book for seven days. No, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I wouldn't think that that would be a, a great incentive for, for anybody to want to buy a pass then. I think it's better if you would do it through the week. Anyways, sorry. Further discussion? 
Peter, this was uh, originally raised by you, yourself at the last meeting, and I just wondered if you had any comments to chime in on what, what you think is best here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going over some of the numbers here. Um, I know when I was reading this report last week, I had some problems with some of the numbers that Aaron had provided, and I should have made notes, but I did not, so I, I apologize for not being fully prepared tonight. Um, I'm not sure how to get around the MOU uh, question, and I realize that that may take a little bit more effort. In terms of providing uh, passes to the municipalities on a per thousand basis, I think that might be a good way to go. Um, but I would still like to see them get into the libraries rather than just giving, giving them away to a, a single individual. Okay, thank you. Anybody else with a comment here? Great, yes, Ian. Thank you, and through you, I too, uh, like my colleague, uh, Peter, feel that um, I'd like to do something. Um, and we have asked staff to come back with a report and there's some effort put into this. And, you know, I don't feel like do nothing is um, a good option to pursue further. Um, and to that end, I, um, I don't know if we have enough here to, to actually make a decision. Like my colleague's comments about wanting to get into the library, that's what really drove me to want to support having staff come back and look what other libraries and conservation authorities are doing. I was hoping that there would be, I don't know yet, maybe another alternative where we can get a pass into the library and have them distribute it. For myself, I was hoping to see something not coming out of, I guess, our typical patrons, but perhaps enticing someone or, or getting a new patron that, you know, was was a patron of the library visiting one of our, our parks. That's what I was hoping to effectuate. But looking at the numbers, um, I really don't feel like this idea was was poaching from our, our, uh, our pod. I thought it was hopefully providing another opportunity for for, like I said, new patrons to, to, to come from our libraries and, and visit these parks. We had some comments earlier uh, from, oh geez, I wanna say it was Robert about um, potential conflicts with different libraries not um, being able to, to buy in. Um, and I, I didn't I didn't see much information back on that subject. So you know, comments spinning into a question um, is that is that still a concern of maybe potentially libraries not being able to, I guess, buy in or or want to partner with us? Okay, thank you for your comments, John Shelton. You know what? I believe we're in a COVID year. We're also in a bit of a cash crunch this year. And you know what, we're looking at handing out freebies and you know, uh, why don't we just put this over to another year when things are a little more lucrative, uh, no lockdowns, things open up. And you know what, uh, I don't think we need to give anything away. If I listen correctly, the uh, park rentals are, are moving right along uh, for the uh, seasonals and uh, they're being sold. Uh, people wanting to get out, people wanting to get into parks and, and doing things. I really don't think we need to do anything this year. Further discussion? Valerie? Yes, thank you, uh, Your Worship, Your Chair, oh, brother, whoever I am, where am I? I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, what I was going to say, could we not include it in our uh, budget deliberations when it comes time? You're a very good idea. Okay, I saw Robert's hand up next. Yeah, just uh, again from a Brant County perspective, uh, it, we, our library is a countywide system. We have various branches. Two of the branches that are not in the Long Point region uh, area are within one's probably within yards of being in it and the other one is within a half a mile of, of being in the watershed but they're not 
I'm curious as to what GRCA and the Brand County Library System, what kind of arrangements they have. And I, I can look into that, but uh, I, I do like the idea of, of encouraging library patrons to uh, uh, use conservation authority. I think the, the idea is good. Uh, I, I think the timing is bad. And I think uh, with, uh, uh, from a Brant County perspective, I'm sure that uh, uh, patrons of uh, the Burford Library and the Scotland Library uh, would qualify even though they're not in the uh, watershed that those in Glen Morris and, and Paris and St. George might be more apt to take advantage of a GRCA uh, program, but um, I'll uh, uh, leave my comments there. And I, I do tend to agree with uh, uh, John that uh, we can uh, uh, revisit this uh, if, if it is uh, not pursued this year, but uh, through a budgetary uh, uh, response and discussion. Okay, I do not see any firm direction coming forward. But uh, is there any further questions to be had? No? Okay, the, the way the motion reads is that basically we receive it as information. And if somebody wants to add something to that, unless you're firmly opposed to that at this time. So the, the motion has been prepared that the LPRC Board of Directors receives the free pack park pass lending program report as information. And did you want to say that you wish to have it further um, advanced to the 2022 budget? Crystal, go ahead. Uh, yeah, that was going to be my question, Mr. Chair. I don't understand the advancing to the, so what is the budgetary, like we're going to start, is that just assuming that we're cannibalizing people that are going in there already? So we're reducing our expected revenue? All right. Oh, no. Aaron, go ahead. Yes, sir, Chair. Um, I put that in as um, when people hear that they potentially could uh, loan, borrow a pass from there, they, instead of may go rent the pass, borrow it from the library instead of paying the typical fee. Um, and I think that consumer behavior that way does, or it could change a senior pass, sen a season pass holder from buying a season pass and renting it from the local library. So, so there is that potential. So uh, why, okay. <laughs> so for a season pass holder, why on earth would we be giving them a pass? If somebody had the money to buy a season pass to begin with, why are we now saying, uh, why can you repeatedly go and get a pass? That, that to me doesn't make sense. If it's a one-off thing because it's somebody that's economically disadvantaged, if that's what we're trying to target, okay. But if somebody keeps showing up every single day to get a pass, I mean, you should be buying your season pass then. And through you, Mr. Chair, I believe that GRCA um, through their MOU, some of the reporting may be to certain questions like, have you ever used GRCA's parks before? Is this your first time? So they're collecting that type of information to promote through the library system, people that may have not used the system. Yeah, I, well, just because that's their system, we can do our own system. To me, it should be a one-time kind of thing. Like if you want to show up one time, you get recorded, you give some ID, you get a pass on a one-time deal. And that way it's not really cannibalizing our revenue. But I have a really hard time of putting another social service on if this is going to be coming up at budget time next year. I mean, we're battling in Norfolk and cutting all kinds of stuff and raising taxes on people at the same time. And now we're going to go throw another social service on them. Like to me, when it's somebody that could have, would have otherwise been buying a pass, like I, I will not be supporting that next year in that capacity. I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea for a very limited number, um, you know, for some economically disadvantaged people um, but not for, for somebody that has the means on their own to do it. Thank you. Over to board member Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just, with, um, regard to the, uh, you know, the giving, uh, of people this past, uh, and not really needing it. I, I'm trying to recall, I thought when we first, uh, broached this subject, that the intent was that it would be a one-time 
use by someone and the overall intent was to promote the use of the parks to get people who otherwise would not have thought about going to encourage them to go. And I, and I think that was mm -hmm. aimed at trying to encourage perhaps people either who have never mm -hmm. been to a park and need to have an experience or those people who for economic reasons can't afford to do it. So uh, I guess I'm a little bit confused because I do take uh, board member Chop's point that you know there there could be certain people who will just uh, you know that'll be part of their their daily or weekly routine is to go pick up their pass to go to the park for free. Um, I, I I do think that we were aiming this at, at a very limited number of passes for promotional purposes only. Thank you, Valerie. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the reason I said budgetary, I just wanted to see what kind of money that we could sort of expect, is it, is it gonna cost us? And if it is, then how much is it gonna cost us? I, I know that the Elgin County Library here has, uh, through the province, gives, them, gives out free passes, but I don't know all the details and I will find out. Thank you. Okay. Crystal? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, my feeling on this would be if we're losing money, then it's not promoting it because the promotion should mean that more people are going to the park afterwards mm -hmm. and also that we're not giving it to the right people because then we're cannibalizing from the people that are already going to the park who we don't need to promote to. Um, we're not getting it to individuals that wouldn't have otherwise been able to go. So if it's costing us money, I'm not sure that it's serving the purpose that this program is meant to achieve. It absolutely sounds like we're all over the floor on this one. Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When, I, when this idea was brought up at our council meeting, the idea was uh, uh, very much to encourage uh, those who would not otherwise visit a conservation area to do so. Um, I don't think anyone in the library system would have the means to be able to police uh, uh, somebody's uh, financial ability to buy a pass or to not buy a pass, but I think it would be a fairly simple option to limit the use of that pass to a one-time per person use throughout the season just by means of a, of a checkout um, catalog or, or list of, of those who have checked out the pass and, and to allow them to do it just once. Um, through this discussion, I was beginning to think along the same lines as, as Vice Chair Shulton that uh, perhaps this might be something better visited to uh, next year. Uh, we're getting very close to the opening of the season now, um, but I do want to make sure that this doesn't get uh, lost in the shuffle for the next number of months and that we do have this discussion uh, uh, a little further along uh, this year in preparation for next year. Um, I do agree with uh, uh, Board Member Chop that uh, if this is going to cost us significant dollars, then it's not achieving the purpose for which we are suggesting it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Peter, this, uh, this was something that was raised by you at the last meeting. So it sounds like we're just basically going to table this right now. And uh, I will, yes? It's Judy. Yes, I please. think um, just going to the point on, on the money side of things, I think when we looked at different, I don't know, the Ontario government, they can, you know, they, they can offer it for the provincial parks, but the other CAs, um, they had sponsorships because I think it does cost money. Um, there was a donation from Toyota Tetsu, no, Toyota, not Toyota Tetsu, sorry, Ian, and that sponsored their program. And they also, from their foundation, there was money given. So there is definitely a cost to running this program. And um, because they did, they did have money uh, put out to offset the cost of those, those passes. So we don't have a sponsor. Um, that's possibly something we could seek, but we don't have a foundation here, but that was also done from the community. So that's another option. If we're gonna do this, you get a sponsorship, they get recognition, they're doing something good, right? And it's uh, good for the community. But I don't, I'm, I don't think we should be having to shoulder social services. So um, we need to make money, so. 
That's my point. There's some agreement there, Judy. So I believe that we should probably receive this as information and uh, perhaps uh, defer to further discussion, to 20, defer to further year 2022 budget discussions. How's that? Okay, so I'll move this motion uh, that the LPRC Board of Directors receives the free park pass lending program report as information and that further discussion take place at the 2022 budget discussion. Uh, mover and a seconder. I'll move it. John Schultz is the mover, seconded by A. Barris. All those in favor? Anybody opposed? I'm just hoping Judy finds us a sponsor. <laughs> She's good at finding sponsors. Okay, so that is carried. Thank you. When, when I read that report, I knew it was going to take a long time to get through that one. Next, we'll move to, uh, we have no uh, review of committee minutes, uh, no correspondence, development applications. Ben Hody, are you with us? There you are. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Page 11 to 20, there are 33 of them. Yep, there are 32 applications before their board for approval. Um, lake levels are still high. Uh, there's quite a few cottages and dwellings along the lake that are being raised. Uh, the, the approval is issued for that, same with shoreline protection works. Because um, this construction industry is really quite busy at the moment. Um, a number of developments such as grading pools are also going in. Um, again, yes, it's been very busy for us, but again, we've had 32 approved uh, at the staff level. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, answer, your, answer the questions. Questions for Ben on any of those 32 applications? Don't see any hands up. So we'll go to this. A mover and a seconder for this motion that the LPRCA Board of Directors receives the staff approved Section 28 Regulation Applications Report dated the 26th of April, 2021 as information. Peter, is the mover, seconded by Ian. Uh, any further discussion? Those in favor? That's carried, thank you. We'll now move to the uh, board approved uh, applications. There's been uh, a recent handout. There were five original of those and now it's gone to seven, I believe. So uh, Ben, I'll let you give this report. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, there are yes, seven um, applications before the board. Uh, the two additions were for dwellings uh, constructed. Um, again, well, quite a bit of structure, uh, construction occurring along the lakeshore. Um, when it does occur along the lakeshore, the appropriate flood proofing standards are met. And again, if you have any questions on these applications or any other applications, I'd happy, be happy to answer those questions. Questions to Ben on any of these seven? Don't see any hands up. So uh, move that the uh, LPRCA, nope. that the LPRCA Board of Directors approves the Section 28 Regulation Development Applications as per staff report dated the 5th of May, 2021. Those in favor? I need a mover and a seconder first, sorry. Ian and Tom. Those in favor? That is carried, thank you. We will now move to the general manager's report, Judy. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So as noted in the report, we had damage from a fire um, in the Wilson track. It's on County Road 60. It was um, a result of a prairie grass burn that got out of control on private land. Um, the area that ended up being burnt was about 7.13 acres. And we had um, been notified by the fire department and we worked with the uh, fire chief of Norfolk to um, deal with that. We had the incident occur the one day and then the next day they got called out again. We had staff also attend that had experience. Um, Chris Reinhardt, the forest technician here, had experience fighting forest fires in 
in the West before he started working here. So he was a great resource and he worked with the, uh, the fire department on site on uh, coming up with a plan and we were able to get a local uh, operator there with an excavator to um, deal with some of the hot spots and um, punch in some roads so that they could actually uh, get their equipment in to put out some of the hot spots. But uh, we did end up going the next day on the Saturday, there was some hot spots that we extinguished ourselves. And then on the Sunday, um, everything seemed to be good because we ended up getting a bit of rain that day. So uh, it was still a pretty serious situation, but um, we were able to deal with it and it turned out to be um, contained at the 7.13 acres. So if you're driving out there, you definitely can see the impact. Um, other than that, our operations have been continuing with the different COVID protocols and we continue to operate within the rules set out by all levels of the government and the um, health units. So we're just trying to keep everyone safe and maintain whatever services we can under the, the different orders. So that's all I have. Questions to Judy with respect to her report? Tom? Huh? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Judy, with regard to the fire that was on, on uh, 60, uh, I have been told that the cause of the fire is actually under investigation. Have you been apprised of any results of that investigation or whether that investigation is still ongoing? Um, the last time I talked with um, Gord Stillwell, the fire chief at Norfolk County, um, he was trying to get in touch with the um, person that had been noted as, I guess we call him the fire boss for the burn that had been filed, trying to, to figure out if he had actually been on site. I think he was trying to gather facts, but I have not heard back if there has been um, where that went. We were able to... Um, the fire chief said that they were going to be sending the bill for the excavator and the additional call out time to the, to the landowner. But other than that, I really do not have any other information at this time. So Judy, there is no, uh, Mr. Chair, if I can, there's no additional cost to the, to the conservation authority for that. So no additional cost from being billed by Norfolk County. It would just be the staff time that we had incurred um, on the Friday and then the Saturday, Sunday. Um, but no, there's no additional costs. And the, and the result of the burn, um, some of the, the fire did go to some of the crowns on, on some of the trees, but some of the trees that were standing were dead. A lot of the, it was a lot of uh, leaf litter, they call it, burning and then getting into some of these dead standing trees or trees that were down that were causing the hot spots. But I think we're pretty fortunate. It could have went been really serious, uh, a lot more serious, but I think with the quick response of the fire department and then and just working together, we're able to uh, deal with it. Okay, thank you, Judy. I, the reason, part of the reason I'm asking is I did get some calls from some neighbors of that property who were a bit concerned about uh, about the whole management of that thing. So uh, thank you. Yeah. That. So yeah, maybe you can follow up on your side with the fire chief. Yes, I will, thank you. <clears throat> Further questions with respect to the general manager's report? Judy, with this fire, was there any uh, claim for liability insurance um, filed? Um, no, we have not pursued the um, insurance side. When we're looking at putting a value on um, the impact of the fire, when I spoke to Debbie Thane, we're not sure that how significant that that would be um, to file an insurance uh, claim on that. I don't have a number right now. I guess as we see it come back, we will be able to see the you know the evidence on actually what was killed and what was uh, what was not killed. But no, we have not filed anything. Okay, thank thank you. Any further discussion to be had? I need a mover and a seconder for this one that the uh, LPRC Board of Directors receives the general manager's report for April 2021 as information. 
Moved by Peter and seconded by Crystal. Those in favor? That is carried unanimously. Thank you. Next, we move to the uh, Conservation Authority Ontario Annual General Meeting. Judy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in this report, um, it's a result of um, having the Conservation Ontario AGM. And the motion that's put forward in this report um, was part of a motion that was passed at that meeting. And it's being put forward for your consideration tonight. The motion is looking for the board to endorse uh, three key actions noted um, in the report is updating the CA administrative bylaws to report proactively on priorities and promote and demonstrate results. There, there are items that come from, these are items that came from a steering committee on the governance, accountability and transparency. So um, all CAs are putting this forward to their membership to, to um, gain support. Also, um, at the meeting, the conservation, um, conservation Ontario annual report was presented and I did include the link in the report if you wanna to go to the website to see that. Kim Gavin also gave a update on the working group that was formed by the Minister Yerrick and that's to help develop the regulations relating to the amendments um, of the CA Act. Nothing's been released yet, however, um, as noted in the report, Kim did report that something will likely be posted shortly in the environmental registry uh, for further public consultation. And that will just be phase one. There's uh, they're breaking things down into a couple phases. So also, um, yes, and they also touched on the Conservation Ontario strategic plan at the meeting. Those are kind of the key things and the um, election of the officers. The new chair for Conservation Ontario is uh, Andy Mitchell from Autonomy Region CA. He's the chair there and the other people are listed there. So that's all I have, thank you. Questions for Judy on her report? No, I, uh, I did attend this meeting as well, the Conservation Ontario meeting in uh, this Andy Mitchell he was actually a federal minister of agriculture at one time. And uh, he's been involved with provincial politics, local politics and federal politics. Okay, if there is no uh, questions with respect to that, I do have a motion which I'll read here. Whereas the provincial government has passed legislative amendments related to the governance of the conservation authorities. And whereas the conservation authorities remain committed to fulfilling accountable and transparent governance. Therefore, be it resolved that the Long Point Region Conservation Authority endorse the three key actions developed by the Conservation Ontario Steering Committee to update Conservation Authority administrative bylaws to report proactively on priorities and to promote demonstrate results. And that staff be directed to work with Conservation Ontario to implement these actions and to identify additional improvements and best management practices. Any further discussion on that? Mover and a seconder, please. Valerie's the mover, seconded by Ian. Those in favor? That is carried, thank you. Yeah. Next, we'll move to Aaron LaDuke's uh, report. And this is the first quarter 2021 budget performance, Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the first quarter operating revenues totaled 1.16 million with expenditures of 746,000. Uh, revenues represented 26.3% of the annual budget and expenditures 16.8% compared to the quarterly threshold of 25%. The surplus sits at $416,198 for the period up to and including March 31st. In comparison to 2022, Revenues are $86,630 higher or 81% and expenditures are down 178,791 or down 19.3% compared to the year before. The operating surplus of 416,198 is $265,000 greater than 2022 or 151,000. 
up 176% year over year. Uh, the campgrounds opened on May 1st in accordance with Ontario Regulation 8220, Schedule 2, businesses that may open in shutdown zones. Uh, nightly camping and day use is prohibited under the regulation uh, that is in effect till May 20th. In the event that the shutdown order is lifted as planned, day use will open to the public on May 22nd and nightly camping on June 3rd, 2021. Uh, the health pandemic has and travel restrictions have created an increased demand for uh, domestic vacation opportunities such as camping. Uh, in 2022, the authority had 329 seasonal campsites registered. Um, at the time of the preparing this report, we have 372 seasonal campsites that have been registered, an increase of 43 sites or 13%. Um, seasonal uh, camping revenues are projected to exceed the budget of $856,250. Um, for the forestry department, uh, the forestry pr uh, program is issued and awarded two of the three plan tenders for the first in the first three months of the fiscal year, resulting in $185,000 in revenue. Uh, 2021 forestry revenues are project, projected to exceed their $300,000 $300, budget at threshold. Um, and this is due to increased demand for lumber and prices. Um, overall, the authority at March 31st, 2021 is sitting in a favorable position. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Questions for Aaron? I see John Schulten's hand up first. Uh, just, just a comment. Uh, I looked at this report prior to the meeting and when I see the activity in renting sites and how that people are itching to get out and go camping, why should we give passes away when it's just not necessary? Okay, thank you for that comment. Any further questions to Aaron with respect to the first quarter budget? No, okay. Move word a seconder for this motion that the LPRCA Board of Directors receives the quarter one financial report, March 31, 2021, for the period up to and including March 31st, 2021, as information. Mover. Tom Michelle is the mover, seconded by Crystal. Those in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for your report. Administrative bylaw. Aaron, this is yours again, please. Thank you. Um, as Judy mentioned in her previous report, there's been some amendments to the Conservation Authorities Act. And on February 22nd, the um, amendments to the Conservation Authority Act through Bill 229 came into force. A number of these changes required um, changes and updates to the LPRC Administrative Bylaw A9420. Um, a summary of the changes has been included on page 49 in the chart. Um, I'll quickly uh, go through and summarize these changes. Uh, firstly, the powers of the authority. We added the word research to study and investigate. Uh, secondly, also under the powers of the authority, the act now requires consent of the landowner or the occupant um, before CA staff can enter. Um, thirdly, under the governance section, there's new language limiting the terms of the chair and the vice chair to two terms, and further appointments must rotate amongst member municipalities. Um, there is a um, request for an exemption um, form that was provided by MECP as attachment number two. Um, the fourth requirement is that financial statements are prepared within uh, public sector accounting standards for local governments and post it to websites within uh, 60 days of approval. Um, fifth, minutes are to be made available to the public within 30 days of holding an authority meeting. Um, all of these changes have been incorporated into the draft LPRCA administrative bylaw that's attached to attachment number one. Um, in addition to the outline changes that are incorporated in the bylaw, uh, there is one other change regarding municipal appointments. Um, and this is that at least 70% of a municipality's appointments must be from the municipality's um, councillors. Um, participating uh, municipalities must appoint in accordance with this new requirement or apply to the minister for an exemption. And that exemption form is attached, 
attachment number three. Um, if you have any questions, I would be happy to take them. Questions for Eric. Don't see any hands up for questions. Okay, I need a mover for, seconder for this one that the LPRCA Board of Directors repeals the LPRCA Administrative Bylaw, Resolution A-94-20, adopted October 7th, 2020, and that the LPRCA Board of Directors adopts the LPRCA Administrative Bylaw as presented. Those in favor? Or, sorry, need a mover and a seconder, sorry. Moved by Ian, seconded by Robert. I'll get you next time, Stuart, sorry. Uh, those in favor? That is carried, thank you. Okay, hey, Judy, you're on for the next one. Provincial Offenses Officer designation. Judy, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, so in this report, we had two staff members, park supervisors attend the training um, there was virtual training put on and they attended the uh, training this spring and we're asking the board to designate Rebecca Dancy and Mandy Krompleck as the Provincial Off Offenses Officer in accordance with the Provincial Offenses Act for the purpose of enforcing the Trespass to Property Act and the Conservation Authorities Act. So this will bring um, some enforcement into the parks uh, with the supervisor, two supervisors and Brandon Good also has the training and the designation. Um, so the training was $700. It was actually uh, quite a bit less because they didn't have to go off site to take the training uh, this year. So it was a very good value. So that's all I have. Questions on this one to Judy? See any hands up? So I need a mover and a seconder. I'll move it. John Schulten's the mover, seconded by Valerie. That the LPRCA Board of Directors designates Rebecca Dancy and Mandy Crumpluck as Provincial Offenses Officers in accordance with the Provincial Offenses Act for the purpose of enforcing the Trespass to Property Act and the Conservation Authorities Act. Those in favor? That's carried, thank you. Next, we've got the uh, prescription operating plan will be presented by Judy. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, in front of the board tonight is uh, two prescriptions, operating plans for two of our properties, the Nemeth track, it is just one section on Nemeth track, the hardwood only, which is uh, approximately 60 acres. And the other is for the gauge track, um, and that is our recent donated property. And this is to do a thinning of the Scotch pine plantation in trying to promote hardwood regeneration at that uh, location. There's um, a Scotch pine stand within the track. And this is just um, the first step in the process, the board approving this, and then we then will be going out to Mark and the properties would be tendered. Um, this prop these properties will be part of the uh, 2022 forestry revenue. So that's uh, for the board to consider the two prescription operating plans. Thank you. Questions with, to, with respect to either one of these uh, properties that are going to have the prescription done? Don't see any hands up or concerns? So, need a mover and a seconder that the LPRCA Board of Directors ex approves the two prescription operating plans, the Nemeth Track, hardwoods only, on the 10th concession of North Walsingham Township, and secondly, the Gage Track, located on Wyndham Road 7 of Wyndham Township. No further discussion. Uh, Tom's the mover, seconded by Dave Barris. Those in favor? 
That is carried. Thank you. We have one last report, and it's with respect to a timber ten tender. And uh, Judy, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in front of the board is um, the timber tender for the parrot track. And we had two bids um, on that. One was from Leonard Pilkey at 13750 and Townsend Lumber at 127275 um, I can say that both of the bids did exceed our target. And we're recommending that the board accepts the highest bid of um, 130750 from Leonard Pilkey. Any questions to Judy with respect to this uh, tender? Okay, a mover and a seconder for this one that the LPRC Board of Directors accepts the tender submitted by Leonard Pilkey for Mark Standing Timber at the Parrot Track, LP-338-21 for a total tender price of $130,750. Mover, Valerie's the mover, Crystal's seconder, those in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We have no further business. Thank you for your participation and cooperation. We did have some uh, technical difficulties. Hopefully we can get that resolved in going into the future. It's not always easy when you end up can't communicate with each other in a meeting of this nature. So thank you and have a good evening. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye.